the book of Hebrews is written to prove the deity of Christ, that he is indeed the Son of God and that he is the only Saviour of the world. This message of the person of the Messiah has to be properly dealt with for a Jewish audience to the people of God concerning his origin, concerning his person, his redemptive work. And therefore, when we study the book of Hebrews, it would give to the people of God a full understanding concerning the deity of Christ. The Son of God became the Son of Man in order that the sons of men may become the sons of God. Jesus is God and the writer of Hebrews declared that God spoke in time past by the prophets and in these last days spoken by his son. Who is this son? He is the heir of all things. He made the worlds. He is the exact representation of the Father. What does it mean, being the exact representation of the Father? Well, Christ is the brightness of His glory, bearing all things by the word of His power, and purged our sins. And Christ fourthly sat down on the right hand of the Father. And the writer tells us how Christ is better than the angels. Of all the created beings of God, the angels are the most powerful. And here, the writer declares the superiority of Christ to the angels. And therefore, he has obtained a better uh, an inheritance that is more excellent, a name more excellent than the angels. And we saw uh, two months ago how the sun is superior, superior to the angels uh, from the Old Testament scriptures, the writer proves the Lord Jesus Christ that He is indeed the Messiah of God, created more excellent than the angels, superior to the angels by His more excellent name in verse 4 of chapter 1 and His unique relation to the Father, that He is indeed as the Father. He is the Son, verse 5. And verse 6, His worship by angels, that the angels worship Christ. So who is Christ? That He is God, and the angels are His servants. And therefore, the writer proves to us who the person of Christ is that we ought to by the grace of God be steadfast in holding on to the knowledge and the application of the Christ whom we know and Paul puts it so well in Colossians 2 verse 2 to 3 he says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches of the fullness of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God 
and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All wisdom, all knowledge, the fullness of it comes from Christ. Knowing Him enables us to find true wisdom. The wisdom of this world is foolishness. But the wisdom of Christ, the mystery of godliness, God wants us to know it so well. In verse 5 to 8, our first thought, our status before God. For unto the angels, verse 5 says, the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified. So he was quoting the psalmist, the psalmist David, saying, What is man in Psalm 8 that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Psalm 8 alluded to the great worth of men in the sight of God. Do you know that you are very precious in the sight of God? There are many who think that they are just one of the many in this world, a speck of sand on the vast seashore, insignificant, unknown. Well, this is not so. God wants you to know that you are precious in the sight of God. And God is in His taking care of the affairs of the universe. Do you know that He cares for you? In, 19, in the 1920s, astronomers just began what we call the Milky Way Galaxy or they were looking and they saw, uh, of which our solar system is one of the infinitesimal part. We discovered 100 billion stars spread out so far, it would take light moving 80 miles per second. It would take 100,000 years to move from one edge of our galaxy to another. And so in 1929, the telescope was able to detect fuzzy blocks that astronomers thought were just gas or blocks. But on closer inspection, it turns out to be galaxies beyond ours, six trillion miles. And we became smaller and smaller as we found the universe bigger and bigger. The U.S. put a telescope in orbit around the Earth, sending back images. The galaxies seem to go out forever and ever and ever. And Albert Einstein in his days, the 1950s, estimated there were more stars already accessible to telescopic photography to all the grains of sand upon Earth. Can you understand what we are saying here? That the number of stars, and you know how great, how big a star is in size, uh, it is said here that how the accessible stars to the telescopic photography is estimated to be more than the grains of sand on Earth. So you know, we know uh, that sand, the sand on earth can hardly be counted. But if you were to compare it with the vastness of God's handiwork, the universe, 
Well, here it is said that the vastness of God's handiwork, if the universe is really that big, then, you know, as you think about ourselves, well, we don't amount to anything, isn't it? Many students sink into deep, irresistible depression. If I'm nothing, meaning nothing and going nowhere, what is the point of going on? Do you think about your own origin, the study of Christ, the study of God and His creation and uh, the redemptive purpose of God sending His Son in the fullness of time tells us about our worth, that we are worth a lot more than we think in the sight of God. This psalm that the writer of Hebrew quotes tells us that though God is the creator of heaven and earth, so great, so big, so uh, aloof, so exalted in His majesty, yet He is concerned for you and I. John Calvin said, well, David, it is true, set before our, His eyes the wonderful power and glory of God in the creation and government of the material universe. But he only slightly glances at this subject, as it were, in passing, and insists principally on the theme of God's infinite goodness toward us. The psalmist <coughs> considers the heavens, and <coughs> as a shepherd, in the life of a shepherd, David frequently afford the opportunity to do just that, to view the vastness of the universe and to ponder, including the moon, the stars. And he cannot help but ask, what is man that thou art mindful of him in comparison to the lofty grandeur of the stars of heaven? Man appears so insignificant wholly unworthy of God's attention. Yet God had made men a little lower than the angels to be crowned, <clears throat> to be the crown of His creation and to have dominion over all the living things. Yet, whereas the position of man was once supreme, it was ruined by the fall. That which the first Adam lost. Our text tells us the last Adam has regained. The Son of Man will rule all of creation and we will reign with Him as heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And so our text tells us that <clears throat> what is man that thou art mindful of him or the Son of Man that thou visitest him? Verse 7, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honour, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. He is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, but now, we see not yet all things put under him. Like Christ, in his first coming, he comes as the Lamb of God, in great subjection to take away the sins of the world. But in His second coming, He will put all things under Him. Right, the Apostle Paul explains to us in the book of Philippians, when he said, 
concerning Christ. That he was made of no reputation, Philippians 2, 7, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath exalted, highly exalted him and given a, a name which is above him above which, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the truth that the writer of Hebrews sought to establish in our hearts. Because if you know who Jesus Christ is and you are aligned with Him in your life, then life finds its true meaning. As we said, in Him lies or in Him is hid all tr the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Him is it too much that we would spend our time to know more about Him? Of course not. We ought to spend all our time. For He is worthy of our pursuit, of our knowing Him more and more. As we know Him, we will grow to love Him. For He is Creator, he is the one that made all things. He is the one that made us. And He is the sustainer. He is the one that keeps all things. All things are kept by Him. Our life is kept by Him. The strength that we have is kept by Him. Our mind is kept by Him. And we thank the Lord that we have a sound mind to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him. And He is the Saviour, the one that has come, the one that we will take hold of for our salvation. And here we ask you to realise right, that we are unique, that you are unique. Just as no two snowflake is the same, you are uniquely made, most beautiful in the sight of God, perfect. And the Lord wants us to know of our distinct person, right? completely separated or completely separate from anyone else. No one thinks exactly like you think. No one feels like you feel, and no one talks like you talk. Scientists now believe that even our voice print is unique. And our fingerprints can be used to positively identify us. Isn't it so true that our fingerprints are all different? And no one else has the same mind, the same temperament, the same body, the same abilities. For God has endowed each one of us with a particular set of characteristics which no one else possesses. As one writer says, I have thoughts, wishes, dreams that are mine alone. I live alone inside my body of flesh and bones, looking at the rest, looking out at the rest of the world through my two eyes. Although I am strangely separated from others, yet I'm not alone. I'm mysteriously linked with my Saviour and my Lord. 
I did not ask to be born, yet I'm here. And because I'm here on earth, I'm under obligation to make good use of this personal existence that God has granted me. Do you realize that you are, well, your presence, who you are, and we are accountable for what we do with ourselves. And so the question, the pressing question is asked then with this question, who am I? Well, the Lord wants you to know that you are important to Him. You are important to this world. That's why He has given you life. And there is a work that He has entrusted to you to do. And for this reason, you are born to fulfill this purpose. <clears throat> and I pray that you would realize the uniqueness of God's plan in your life. And we can choose to ignore the truth, escape from this world, as it were, through drugs, through drink. But the Lord wants us to know that we are special in His sight. And the Lord wants us to know that He has a plan for our lives, a special work for you to do. Will you uh, live for Him? Will you accept the challenge? Will you place yourself to prepare yourself to be a useful instrument for Him? Well, the Lord wants you to live that life and he is indeed preparing shaping so that shaping you so that you may be conformed to his image our lord is has condescended to become man he is god himself and yet he condescended verse 9 and 10 speaks of that his condescension but we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So, what was the purpose of Christ's existence? Why did God have to send His Son in the fullness of time as the final revelation of God well, here is given to us the reason for it became him or <clears throat> that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Right? Death is the curse for every man that is born after Adam since the fall. And he would Taste death. In other words, he would conquer death on our behalf. That death would lose its sting in Christ. The Apostle Paul writes well when he said the work of Christ, how <clears throat> he, through him, Death has lost its sting. Verse 55 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. It is because of sin that man has to die. But the strength of sin is the law. Law, the law represents or... Uh, exactly presents what is sin. 
a transgression of the law. But thanks to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That was the plan of God for the redemption of men. That the redeemed men may live by the glory of God. He says in verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In other words, all things were created for his glory. And by whom are all things? In other words, he is the first mover. He is the mover of all things. All life is sustained, created, saved by Him in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Christ suffered. He, it was predicted how by the, by the prophet Isaiah how the Messiah would come and He would suffer as a man. Isaiah 53 describes for us the record of the prediction that came true in Christ. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes are we healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every man to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Christ should taste death for us, so that death may be conquered by him on our behalf to make him the captain of our salvation. What a saviour! He is the creator. He made all things and he is the sustainer. He keeps all things, including us, and He is a Saviour. He saves us for all eternity. Let us acknowledge Him for who He is and worship Him and serve Him. For indeed, how can we serve the Lord? Well, it is by our worship of Him, acknowledging that how we need Him, that all life comes from Him, that He has a good plan for us in our lives. For His own honour, for His own glory, He has made us and it behooves us to indeed love Him and serve Him. Our status before God, verse 5 and to 8, and verse 9 to 10, our Lord's condescension. He was made man for us, that men may be brought nigh to God through Him. May the Lord uh, impress upon our hearts the, uh, the work of the Saviour, the redemption that He has wrought for our uh, well-being, eternal well-being, you see, now you may not be able to fully comprehend what a great salvation He has made for you. This will only be made apparent, only clear in eternity. But through the Spirit of God, He will enlighten you and He will help you to see the future. And we live in the light of His Word to that future that is before us. What a glorious future! And He wants us to take hold of it today and live that life for His own honour and glory by sharing forth to a dying world this Saviour, the only Saviour of the world, that He is the Creator and He is a sustainer. And how the world do not know Him today. How we must proclaim Him. 
at this moment, at this time in human history when the world is crying out for a saviour, saviour against the death click. You remember when the snakes came and bite the people of Israel when they transgress against God? What did Moses do? Moses raised up a brazen serpent and all who looked up were all healed pointing to the Christ that would come he would be lifted up to defeat death he is the savior of the world and men in his rebellion do not want to acknowledge him but we who know let us know better to love him to follow him to live a life of holiness that is pleasing to him for his own honor and glory may god help us let us pray father we thank thee for thy word thank thee for thy mercy in strengthening us to understand who Christ is, that he was made to suffer death for us, that by his death we may have life. So Lord, we thank thee that Jesus rose from the dead the third day, triumphant, and this life he imparts to us. Spiritual life, when we take hold of what he had done for us and eternal life that he imparts to us through faith. O oh Lord, may our faith that has begun through this knowledge, through this acknowledgement of our sins and our, by a contrite and repentant heart, spur us on from faith to faith that we may do his good will for thy own honor and glory this i pray with thanksgiving through jesus christ our lord amen